So starting a new Bible study tonight, and it's, it's going to be about free will. And one of the reasons that we're going to do this is because this is exactly what I was studying the last two days. Every two years, professors from our seminary, which is in Wisconsin, travel around the country and give traveling classes to pastors just to encourage us to keep on learning and studying. And they're not like light, fluffy things. It's not kind of show up and it's fun and me. It's meant to be show up and spend 14 hours over two days studying really intensive, like we have a whole class packed into two days. And the class was all about free will. And so I'm going to share with you as we go through the summer the things that I was able to learn in the last couple of days. Hello, come on in. Just to get us started, free will is something that people think about a lot, including you. You just might not realize it. And so to start with, I have some phrases that people say pretty commonly that express either a belief that we human beings have free will or that we don't. Let's see what I mean. Whatever will be, will be. You didn't know it in Spanish. That's I, I didn't know that was Spanish. <laughs> Okay, sirrah, sirrah. Whatever will be, will be. Okay, you've heard somebody say that. When somebody says that, what do they mean? It's all up to faith. It's all up to faith. Whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen. And sure, I can do what I want to do and make my plans, but whatever's going to happen, it's going to happen. So if we're thinking about free will, if someone says this, what are they saying about free will? Not so much. Not so powerful. Okay. Whatever will be, will be. It's not up to my will. It, there's something else that's going to determine what's going to happen. All right? Here's the next one. You are free to choose. Can you hear people say that? You are free to choose. I, I like how this continues. It's, but you are not free from the consequence of your choice. So it kind of has a wide ending to it. But it's phrase your freedom to choose. Right? You have the right... To make a choice. We said that. We hear people say that. If somebody says that, which side of the free will debate are they on? Free will. We have at least, I mean, we've got some free will, right? Yeah. There's a lot of choices that we make. How about this one? Maybe hard to, to read. As luck would have it. You ever see that? You could probably substitute word as. Chance would have it, as fate would have it, as luck would have it. What does somebody mean when they say that? There is, it, it's all predetermined. Yeah. yeah, it's all predetermined. A lot of times people say this about something in the past, right? Well, I was going to do this, but then, as luck would have it, right, there was a tornado. And then, <laughs> I couldn't do what I was going to do. You know, or we ran out of gas on the side of the road. And then, it, so, according to this, what's really... The thing that controls things, not my free will, it's luck. It's luck. Right? In the ancient world, there was a god who was called fate. Fate was one of the gods. Because it sure seems like fate is the one controlling things. Gamblers are big on that one. Yeah, that's, yeah. you can see the dice in the back, right? It's luck would have it. How about be you, do you, for you? This is kind of a really popular thing these days. Be you. Do you. For you. Yeah. What's somebody saying when they say that? It's all about me. It's all about me. And who seems to be the one who has the power to determine what happens? I do. I'm going to choose what I want to do, what I want to be, and to do it for me, and you better not say anything about it. I'm free. Right? Here's a couple more that begin to apply it spiritually. If the Lord wills. You ever heard that before? Hopefully. I think that people say this less than they used to. Do you agree with that? I bet some of you can remember a time when people would probably say this quite a bit. My grandparents used to always say, if the Lord's willing and the creek don't rise. Yeah, the Lord's willing and the creek don't rise. If the Lord wills. If somebody says, if the Lord wills, what are they saying about free will? 
It's not really up to me. It's not really up to me. Right? And so this is what somebody would say after you know, describing their plans. I'm going to graduate in high school and then I'm going to go to OSU and study engineering. If the Lord wills. Or this summer we're going to go on vacation, visit the Rocky Mountains. If the Lord wills. Man plans, the Lord decides. Yeah, man plans, the Lord decides. That's a verse in the Bible. Okay, so the Lord wills. That's um, more on the side of it's really God who's got the will. I'm just following God's path. Well, last one. This is what we heard about at church this last Sunday. The prayer of salvation. You heard this? I bet you've heard this somewhere. Lord Jesus, come into my life. I accept you as my Lord and personal Savior. I believe in my heart that you died and rose from the dead to save me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just pray this, you can send your name and phone number and prayer request to the altar call people. It's at us. So I don't mean to make fun of all this. Some good things in this, right? Jesus is our Lord and Savior, absolutely. And through faith in Jesus that we're saved. But what do you think the person who wrote this or says this thinks about free will? Yeah. That they yeah. accepted. That we have to, yeah. right? Yeah, I need to accept. I need to accept Jesus. And this is how a lot of Christians talk today. Right? There's a lot of different views about free will, but prevailing among Christians is this idea. God's done a whole bunch of things. It's all good. But ultimately, I have the free will to decide to believe it. I have the free will to invite Jesus into my home. Okay, and so this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about what does the Bible say about free will compared with the will of God. So that as Christians, we don't just say what our popular phrases among Christians today, but we're actually able to talk the way the Bible talks. And as we go along, I think that we're going to find that what the Bible says is actually different than what we usually think. And maybe even the way that we usually talk. Right? So we're going to talk about free will. Here's just a, a, a line. Could you tell it? It's meant to show two very different sides. Okay, First I'm going to put up some really deep theological terms. Divine monergism and human monergism. You ever heard those words before? Divine and human, yes. You've heard divine and human, so divine, who's that side referring to? God. God and human, that's referring to us people. Monergism, it has the, the word mono in it, which means like one or alone. Urgism, can you kind of see the word energy? Energy, so it's like one working or working alone. So, monergism means working on your own. Divine monergism would be God is doing everything on his own. Human monergism would be people are doing everything on their own. Does this make sense? Okay, so if we talk about a human's free will, if someone really has free will, which side of this scale are they going to be on? Way over here. So if I am free to do whatever I want to do, if I have free will, then we're talking about human monergism. If, on the other hand, everything happens that the Lord wills, and it's all God deciding everything, then we've got divine monergism. Okay, we could put up here, but we'll, we'll do this later on in a number of weeks. We could put up here a whole bunch of different Christian denominations or beliefs based on which side of this they emphasize. You understand what I'm saying? And so even if you look at what are the differences between denominations, you could plot them up here. Some denominations are really, really big, and this is all about you and your choice, and you need to do the right things. Some are over here, which is, you know, it's really all God, all the time. Right? Now here's the extra credit for today. What would be this whole area in the middle called? Synergy. Wow, yes. So you know, all God, all people.
people in the middle would be synergism, which is working together. Working together. So we're, if we're thinking about wills and who is it that determines what happens, okay, it's really, there's, there's this whole scale. All God, God does everything. All people, free will, people do everything. And then there's this huge middle ground of some kind of a combination. Maybe God does 90% and we do 10% that'd be over here. Maybe people do 75% and God does 25% and that'd be over here. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, and all this middle area is synergism. We're working together with God somehow when it comes to wills. Here's a definition of free will. Now, people could define it different ways, but I think this is a useful definition for us. Free will is a power of the human will by which a person can apply himself to those things that lead to eternal salvation or turn away from the sin. So free will is a power that the human will have to apply yourself to the things that lead to eternal salvation. So, does that, does that seem too complicated? Not meant to be complicated. Free will means I have a power to apply myself toward my salvation. Now notice, it, it doesn't necessarily say that free will means I can do everything to save myself. There's going to be different levels of free will that we'll talk about. But just this idea of free will is I have the capability, the power in me to do at least some of the things that are needed to be done for me to be saved, or to the free will to not do them so that I'm not saved. Yeah. Does that make sense? Can you understand that definition? I think so. Some of you look like you don't understand, which is okay. So I ask a question. Well, so, what, I mean, do we really have the power to apply ourselves? I mean, we get that from the Holy Spirit. Right. So. Yeah, so, but you're, you're thinking too far ahead. Okay. I'm not saying that we have this power. Oh. I'm just defining the word free will. So, let me give a... I, I so think, I'm not Christian. <laughs> no, but I mean, the, the word free will has a definition, whether we believe that it exists or not. But when we say free will, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about a power inside human beings to work toward their salvation in some way, or to work against them. And what we're going to study in the Bible study is, do we have that or not? Does that make sense? So we need to study whether we have that or not. Okay. Is the term free will meant to apply only by this definition? So, what this definition is meant to do is to limit what we're talking about a little bit. Because sometimes when people talk about free will, they talk about you got to choose what you ate for supper today. Did you choose what you ate for supper today? Yeah. Did you have free will? Did you have the free choice to decide? Yes, we know. Most of us, and some of us didn't. <laughs> 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 but hopefully you can recognize we're not going to spend a number of weeks talking about deciding what we eat for supper. Okay, so we're, we're, we're narrowing down. You could have a much broader definition of free will. You could say the freedom to choose any number of things. But as we think as Christians about this, what, what we're trying to, to, to study is, do, do human beings, when it comes to salvation, have a free will to do some of the things that are necessary to be saved? So we narrow this down. To, into the context of salvation. We're narrowing it down to the context of salvation. Got it. Melanie said, no. You don't want to do that? No, I'm, I'm okay with doing that. I'm just saying that we, that, that's... Let me get to the next slide, okay? <laughs> this is, hopefully this will help us. So we got the same definition, the power of a human will by which a person can apply himself to the things that lead to eternal salvation, turn away from them. Okay? So we're not talking about free will in things below us. This is how Martin Luther would talk. That there's things that are below us, even as human beings. We're not talking about those things. So, you're wearing clothes. All of you are. It's a good thing. 
Okay, where you got up today? Did somebody force you to wear the clothes that you're wearing today? No, who chose them? You did. Okay, but that's something that's below us, right? You drove here today. Okay, did you decide how fast you were going to go? More or less? You did. Okay, and so there's, there's all sorts of decisions in life that God puts into the hands of human beings. He does. There's things that are below us. You think about in Genesis chapter 1, God told Adam and Eve to rule over rule over the world. Now, as we go through this, we're going to see, of course, God is still in control of everything. But there are things that are below us. Okay? The clothes you wear, the foods that you eat, even you know the jobs that you have. Of course, God's hand is behind it all. But there's a whole bunch of decisions that from our human perspective, it looks like we're free to make. Does this make sense? It's not what we're going to talk about in this class. But what we're talking about, free will and things that are above us. So do I have free will when it comes to finding my way to heaven? Do I have free will when it comes to my relationship with God? Do I have free will when it comes to commands or promises or sin. Okay? Do you understand that distinction? Okay, so we, we could lose somebody if, if, if we as Christians were to say, well, people don't have free will. And somebody says, well, I chose to go to Chick-fil-A, not McDonald's tonight. What are you going to do about that? <laughs> you say, well, right. I mean, you have freedom in, in those things that are below you. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the things of God. And of course, the things of God are things that are above us. Do we have this power in us to do what needs to be done for the things above us? That's what we want to examine. But do you understand this? I mean, would you apply the word spiritual things to the bottom? You could say spiritual things. So the things above us would be spiritual matters. Okay, and again, we're not separating God from me. It's not like, well, anything physical, I can handle my own. It's not what we're saying. Okay, but we're especially focused on what what power does my human will have in spiritual matters? That'd be a good way to say it. Anybody follow this? So, we're going to study this based on a book that Martin Luther wrote. And it's the book, The Bondage of the Will. And this is the book that I was studying the last two days. I had to read the whole thing and spent 14 hours talking about it. We probably could have spent a lot more hours in that talking about it too. Okay? When, when Martin Luther was near the end of his life, people asked Martin Luther, of all the things that you've written, what things are, are worth it for people to continue to pass on? And I don't know but if you know, but Martin Luther wrote an incredible amount of things. So like people have been translating his works into English. And there's a set of Luther's works that I think it's now up to 60 volumes. So you can imagine like those two bookshelves back there could be completely filled just with things that Martin Luther wrote. So at the end of his life, people asked him, of all the things that you wrote, what is, what is really worthwhile? And he said, the catechism? You know, like the catechism that we teach kids in catechism class? And the bondage of the will. Why are those two things? Yeah, not that great. But those two things, at the end of his life, that's what he said. This, these are good things for people to keep reading. So ironically, in my whole life, up till now, I had never read this, the Bible is a book, so I'm a little embarrassed to say. But it's really kind of a thick book. It's, it's not written for, for lay church members. It's really a scholarly book, which is different than a lot of the things Martin Luther wrote. All about whether people have free will. And so we're not going to do a lot of history, but we have to we have to do some history to understand this. And you all like history. I know. You've all told me. So a little review. First on Martin Luther. You see the dates that he lives down here. 1483 to 1546. Hopefully some of this will be familiar to you. Martin Luther first studied to be a lawyer. Then he became an Augustinian monk. 
So a, a monk in the Catholic Church, but there's different types of monks. He was an Augustinian monk, which meant he followed especially the teachings of St. Augustine, who lived way back in the, the 300s. He taught at the University of Wittenberg. Wittenberg. Do you notice I put a blank there? Like you can write this down. So Wittenberg, Germany, which is not a very big or important city. It wasn't the most they did, but they had a university. Right at the front of the University of Wittenberg. Here's just a couple of key dates from his life. October 31st, 1517 is when he put the things on the door. He put the things on the door. Yes. The 95 theses were nailed to the church door. And remember, that was him saying, I want to debate these things. It's like putting them on a bulletin board. Who, who wants to debate these things with me? 95 concerns he had about the Christian teaching in the Catholic Church. He wanted to debate. Once he did that, things moved pretty quickly. And by April 2021, there was an important meeting where he was was excommunicated from it. He was excommunicated after the meeting was over. But there was a meeting that happened. That was the end of his time in the Catholic Church. Something about worms. Yeah? <laughs> The diet of worms, which is unfortunate in a lot of different ways, because diet means meeting, not like what you eat. And worms was just the name of a city. Yeah. So it had nothing to do with the little creatures that live in the mud. It was a meeting at the city of, of worms, and that's where Martin Luther was called before the emperor and the Catholic authorities, and he was presented with his writings and said, do you recant? And he said, give me a little time to think about it. So I gave him a day. And he came back, and they put him all in front and said, do you recant? And he said, well, what do you mean? Because in some of these, all I've done is just quoted the Bible. Do I recant of what I'm just quoting the Bible? And he said, no, we're not discussing anything. This, these works that you have, do you recant? And he said, Unless I can be shown otherwise from the Word of God, then I cannot and will not recant. And from that moment on, he was an outlaw for the whole rest of his life. And anyone, anywhere could have found him and caught him and killed him because he was an outlaw in the Roman Empire ever since that day. There's three things he really liked to focus on as he taught the Bible. Remember what those are? Faith alone, grace alone, scripture alone. Okay, sometimes people add in Christ alone and to the glory of God alone. The three most ones that we've been told on to grace alone, faith alone, scripture alone. Alright, hopefully that was a little bit of everybody. You've heard of Martin. Alright, how many of you have heard of Desiderius or Rasmus? Just a, a, you wouldn't know about a guy named Desiderius. He was a humanist. He was a humanist. So, Desiderius or Rasmus is the one who gets Martin Luther to write about free will. And so we have to know a little bit about him. 1466 to 1536. So was he older or younger than Martin Luther? Older. By like how many years? 20. Yeah, like close to 20. 17? 17 years older. So he's somebody who's older than Martin Luther. They're living at the same time. He started as an Augustinian monk. That should sound familiar. <laughs> like who? Like Martin Luther. Okay? But unlike Martin Luther, he didn't, he didn't last long. And so he decided to leave the monastery and he never went back. He was a Renaissance humanist, which are just kind of big flowery words, right? Have you heard of the Renaissance? Like this period of a flowering of art and writing and literature, right at the time of Martin Luther, the 14th and 1500s. Uh, a humanist, here, here's some things that he did as a humanist. He, he believed in these Latin words, ad fontes, which means back 
to the sources. And so what Erasmus said is we got to go back to the original sources. And so we don't have to have all these traditions and all these, you know, just theories and myths. We want to go back to the sources. And one of the things that he did going back to the sources is he was a Greek expert. And he published the Greek New Testament in a thorough scholarly way that it hadn't been published for a long, long time. And so he studied Greek, he studied all the different manuscripts of the Bible that were available at that time, and as this expert, he, he put together the Greek New Testament, and with this idea, back to the sources, he was big on, we need to go back to the original Greek. Okay, in, in Martin Luther's day, what language did everybody have? The, not everybody. Latin. What language was the violin? A few people had it. Latin. 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 Even the experts were all using Latin. They weren't going back to the original Greek. Erasmus said, we got to go back to the, the sources. We're going back to Greek. And so this was a huge accomplishment. That was a huge blessing for the Lutheran Church and the Reformation. It was right before Martin Luther was doing his reforming. Here we have the, Greek, the New Testament, not just this Latin translation, but the, the, the real text of the original languages. Coincidentally, at the same time, there was another man doing the same thing in Hebrew. But he didn't write about free will, so we don't have to worry about him. But God worked this out that at this very time, there was also somebody collecting Hebrew manuscripts and producing a scholarly, accurate Hebrew Old Testament too. A couple more things. He was a bold champion of sound learning and free thought. He like traveled all over. He was like at Cambridge in England and went to Rotterdam and Amsterdam. He went to, those aren't the same place. He went to one of those two, Rotterdam up in the Netherlands. He was in Rome, traveled all over the place. He was very concerned about corruption in the church. But he was a very close friend of the Pope. Sorry, that's ironic. Which is very ironic, because it wouldn't seem to go hand in hand, because according to Martin Luther, the Pope was directly responsible for a lot of the corruption in the church. And so he was concerned about corruption. He wants us to go back to the original writings of Scripture. He's big on learning and freedom of thought. And he's this world-renowned professor who travels around teaching. Make sense? Okay, since his first name is so hard to say, we won't use his first name from now on. It's just Erasmus. Erasmus. Alright, so from what we just talked about, these two of them have a few things in common. What would be things that they have in common? Augustinian. They were both Augustinian monks. So they had this in common. Okay? Both had roots in the Catholic Church. Both were, had been monks. Both really knew the writings of St. Augustine well. So Augustinian monks. What else do they have in common? Luther translated his Bible into German. So this, this concern for the scriptures. And so this idea, we want to go back to the original Greek and Hebrew and we're not going to base stuff on tradition. At least we, it's not the goal. We want to base it on the words of the Bible. Those are good things they have in common. What else? Concern about corruption in the church. And so Erasmus wrote things against the Catholic Church. Just like Martin Luther did. Right? We need there to be changes in the church. Because there's corruption, there's Problems. Indulgences right? was for more than, than corruption. They were. Yeah, so you think about indulgences and just the lifestyle of priests and bishops and things like that. Martin Luther wasn't the only one who noticed this is just so, so wrong. Extravagant. Yeah, extravagant, and Erasmus would write about that. Okay, so they had some things that were in common, which made a lot of people think that they were on the same side. And so people would keep asking Erasmus, oh well you must be on you must be on Luther's side. And they would say to Martin Luther, oh you must be you and Erasmus, you must be 
on the same side. And so there was kind of this pressure, wow, maybe these two, they should just work together. And they can accomplish a whole lot if they just work together. The problem is, they had a lot of things that were different. Just from what we talked about, can you pick out things that were different? So, feelings toward the Pope. And so Erasmus, somehow, he's good friends with the Pope, even with all this corruption. So he's not trying to, to get rid of the Pope's authority or to change that. And Martin Luther realizes this. This is one of the main things that's leading people away from God. Is this man decreeing things that God doesn't decree? Okay, other differences? Erasmus was a humanist. Yeah, so Erasmus was a humanist, and maybe, maybe even more, he was he was a scholar. And what was Martin Luther? He was a whole bunch of different things all at the same time. A religious man. He stayed a religious man, and so I think with Erasmus, you could say he started out as a monk, but he really became kind of like a a scholar. And Luther, his whole life, stayed a pastor, a professor, but a professor of pastors and a pastor of a church. Any other differences that you notice? I'm glad that you're not looking ahead because you're all listed, right? You're <laughs> but you're, you're being good students. Here's, let's see if we can notice the ones. So our Luther, he, he loves the Word of God. He's a pastor, and his goal is faith in Jesus in the heart. How do we lead people to eternal salvation through faith in Jesus? Okay, does this sound familiar? This is what our Lutheran church is about. Erasmus was peace loving. Erasmus's main goal was to have everybody get along. And that makes sense if he's friends with the Pope, right? So he wants there to be some changes, but he wants everybody to get along. He doesn't want there to be conflict. He's an academic, so he's thinking scholarly thoughts. He's not thinking about people's souls. He's not responsible for people's souls. He's just thinking about knowledge. And his goal is outward morals. How do we get people to live good lives? Okay, can you see the difference? So now maybe especially this last point. A goal of faith in Jesus in the heart or a goal of art outward morals. If there's this problem of corruption in the church, and so we've got priests who are living extravagant lifestyles or living sinful lifestyles, and according to Erasmus, what's the goal? To live a good life. We've got to get people to shape up their lives. Right? It's we've got more to get, about the here. We've got to get people to live better lives. What would Luther say? more concerned with their heavenly life. Yeah. And because of that, what, what would he say? He would well, the primary goal is to get people to shape up their lives. What would, what would shape the goal up be? their hearts. And yeah, what's the first of the 95 Faith. theses? I don't know any of the other 94. <laughs> <laughs> but I know I told you the first of the 95 theses on a couple of different occasions. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent. He will that the entire life of a Christian be one of repentance. And so there's all this corruption in Erasmus. We've got to just get people to live good lives. And Luther says we've got to get people to repent and find forgiveness in Jesus. Okay, now, if you think about that, the, the outward result might be similar, right? But it's a world of difference between the two. Yeah. Erasmus, we want to get everybody to get along and we want people to live good lives. Luther, we want people to hold to the word of God and we want people to repent and to believe in Jesus. There's so, a lot of religions that have to do with those yes. two very right. different ideas. And I think even not just religion, but within Christianity. There's, there's different sides. That's why there's so many different denominations, right? People ask, why are there so many different churches? Because we don't believe the same thing. Okay, there's some churches who still want to do these things. 
There's churches who really are all about these things, and that's what our Bible says. We talk about free will. It's it's going, it's the foundation of these differences. Right? We're almost done with the history part. You're doing good so far. It almost looks like you're interested in this. That's good. <laughs> Erasmus finally writes a book. De libero arbitri on free will. You see like the, the word liberty, freedom, and arbitrary is will. So free will. So Erasmus writes a book and he calls it <coughs> on free will. It's published in 1524. Okay, he's pressured to write against Luther to prove he wasn't on Luther's side. And so it seems like the real reason that he wrote was he had to prove that he wasn't on Martin Luther's side. And this is what he decided to write about, to prove that he wasn't on Martin Luther's side. The ironic thing is that it's written on a subject matter that Erasmus wasn't that concerned about. And so he writes a book on free will, although he himself isn't really that concerned about free will. But he feels compelled he has to write something against Martin Luther. And so this is what he writes. So, Martin Luther responds. And he writes, De servo arbitri. You see, it's almost the same words. He just changes one word. So instead of liberty, free will, we've got a serving will or a slave will. And so people usually translate it the bondage of the will, like the slave will. It's December 1524. So uh, people actually criticized Martin Luther for waiting so long. It was like 16 months. And now, the book he wrote is 320 pages long. You think, I would probably need about 16 months to make, make 320 pages. Uh, but he took that long. And, uh, and in his introduction to the book, he says the reason that he took so long wasn't that he needed that much time. He was busy. He actually got married in the interim. But he said one of the main reasons was he could not believe that Erasmus had written something so stupid. <laughs> and he just could not, it was just, he just couldn't, how am I supposed to write against something that is so foolish as what you have written? And so the delay has been caused by just such <coughs> foolish things that you said. I didn't even know what I should say back. That's how Martin Luther would write. So he refuted Erasmus' arguments in favor of free will. He criticized Erasmus' careful, careless use of the scriptures. And then he presented the Bible's teaching of the bodily will. And so this is what we're going to do these next weeks in this class. It's going to take a while. And obviously, you see the final answer. Does the Bible teach that we have a free will or that we have a bound will? A bound will. Okay? We're giving away the answer, just with the title of these books. But there's a whole lot to talk about and study as we go through this. Okay, so we're going to take it just bit by bit. And talk, what does the Bible really say about our will and what we have the freedom and the power to do? Ma'am? Just one question. Who was pressuring Erasmus to write the book? Good, so Erasmus is pressured to write this. Who's, who's pressuring him? Catholic. So a whole bunch of different people. The, the Pope, the Pope himself would write to Erasmus and say, Erasmus, you have to write against Martin Luther or people are going to think you're on this side. The king of England wrote to Erasmus and said, you've got to, got to write against Luther. Otherwise, you're just going to think that he's... And so very powerful figures actually were writing. And, and so it seems like Erasmus as this peace-loving person, he really doesn't... He's not really that concerned about it. And he knows that if he writes something against Martin Luther, Martin Luther's going to write something very harsh back. Because that's what Martin Luther did when people wrote something against the Bible. But he finally felt, I have to, I have to make a break. And this is what he chose to write about. Good question, get it? Okay, you said Martin Luther's book was 360 or something. How much? It was less. It was less. Many less. So of course it all depends on, I mean, how the publisher lays out the words on the page, right? So my English translation of 
the bondage of the will is like 320 pages. I haven't actually read on the freedom of the will, but the, the English one I saw was like 70 pages, 80 pages. So Martin Luther wrote a lot more back than what Erasmus had originally read. Yeah, I think it's right. In order, in order to so this is like when I say what, what he does in this book, he, he takes every single point that Erasmus makes in favor of free will, and he contradicts. And along the way, every time Erasmus misquotes the Bible, he corrects it. And then at the end, he presents, and here it is, just the true teaching from the Bible. And so it's, it's a very, very thorough, I mean, every argument you make, I'm going to write a response for the Bible. I think that was Martin Luther. That was what Martin Luther did. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then he threw in a lot of kind of barbs and names and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's just a simple summary. Erasmus was primarily focused on morality without concern for doctrinal details. Luther was primarily focused on the truth of Scripture and the contents of the people. So, as we go through, we're just going to ask some of the questions that they bring up in his books. And before they even get to free will, the first question that comes up is, should Christians make assertions? What's an ass assertion? Presentation of facts. Yeah. Should Christians make strong declarations, this is true? Should Christians make assertions? Okay? This is the first point that comes up. Erasmus says, I don't want to make assertions. He says, I find so little faction, satisfaction in assertions that I would readily take up the skeptic's position. And so Erasmus says, you know what? Unless somebody absolutely makes me, I don't want to say anything assertive. Interesting for someone writing a book as an expert on a topic to say, right? But I don't want to make an assertion. I gladly submit my judgment to these authorities and all that they lay down, whether I follow it or not. Just do what you're told. And so he said, you know what? I know that the Catholic Church has some errors in it, but I'll just I'll just go along. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna assert something against it. Okay, from what we learned about Erasmus, what was probably behind his desire to be a skeptic? Friendship with the Pope. So he's got this friendship with the Pope, and yeah. isn't it true sometimes in our lives that relationships can make us shy about speaking the truth, or being bold, and speaking what needs to be said? So he's got this friendship with the Pope. There's one other, well, I shouldn't just limit to one, but there's a couple other things that we said about Erasmus that fit with, I don't really want to make assertions about things. He's peace loving. And so, you know, I'd rather just have everybody get along. And, you know, if we're all just going to assert, well, this is true and that's true, well, people are going to be on different sides and we're not all going to be along and get together. He was primarily concerned with morality. And he's really mostly concerned with morality. So, you know, you can believe it's not that important, but just do the right thing in these areas and that's good enough. Now, do any of these sound familiar today? Deeds, not creeds. You ever heard that? Doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe something. Or I'm a non denominational Christian. There's a whole lot of answers. <laughs> How about a non denominational church? Oh, yeah. So anybody who goes to a non-denominational church would be a non-denominational Christian. Okay. And it's like the what are all these the things? Person. What are these all basically saying? You don't have a belief. I don't want to. I don't want to assert beliefs. Yeah. Right. So you're going to add well, something. Well, the human view is is that. Right. You know, Just and this. It's, it's your own experience. And that's true for you, or their experience, and that's true for them. What's true for you isn't true for me, yeah. right? And what's important is we all try to be good people. 
So let's just all try to be good people. Not going to worry about what people believe. We'll be good people. And there you go. Okay? You see this, this same sentiment is so common today. Why is it so popular today to not make assertions? Because we all want to get along. Because we all want to get along. The big thing out there now is my truth. Uh, for my truth. We all want to get along. And we don't want somebody to deny what we believe. If I never tell you what, what I believe, what can't you do? Can't correct me or criticize me. Oh, I can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can find a way to criticize anybody. <laughs> but you, you see this? So, you know, let's just not make a big deal about a lot of things the Bible says. Okay, let's just all get along. Let's try to be good people. I'm not going to make a big point about what I believe. You don't make a big point about what you believe. Nobody will have the feelings. Nobody will have the this is the world we live in. Go along to get along. Yeah, so, yeah, live in that loop. Yeah, I should have had your help as I was writing this. I was like, <laughs> trying to, there's so many phrases that go along with this, right? Okay, so this isn't the new thing. 500 years ago, they were having the same discussion. Okay, let's not make assertions. It's all right to be skeptical about everything. We're going to try to keep the peace. That's what's most important. Okay, right? makes sense. So I said Martin Luther is going to go along and disagree with every single thing that he says. <laughs> and Martin Luther says, "Take away assertions, and you take away Christianity." What do you think he meant by that? You have to be able. To, you can't be a Christian without being able to assert what you believe. It so, kind of is what you believe. Excellent. You can't be a Christian without believing something. And if you believe something, you absolutely need to assert it. Okay, here's a couple more things. He said, uncertainty is the most miserable thing in the world. Yeah. How did Martin Luther know that? Because he'd been uncertain. Right? Because for years and years of his life, he was uncertain. He was sure he was going to hell. Right? He lived with uncertainty for years. And so he could say, no, it's not a good thing to be uncertain about what God says. If you're uncertain, you don't have a foundation. You don't have a solid thing to stand on. We need something to base our lives on. Absolutely. Okay, he said the Holy Spirit is no skeptic. Uh, it's true, isn't it? When the Holy Spirit put down the words of the Bible, did he know what he was talking about? He didn't say maybe if. <laughs> maybe if. In the beginning, maybe if God created the world. It's not how the Holy Spirit talks, right? The beginning, God created the world. It's an assertion. What does each passage assert about assertion? We need to really study the Bible, don't we? <laughs> Most classes are even more in the Bible than what we've done tonight. I should put up the Matthew 10. disciples, as he does so, he gives them some instructions. So I'm going to read it. It's what, like 17, 18 verses. I'm going to read it all. And as I go through it, just make a mental note down. What does Jesus say about making assertions? About speaking boldly what the truth is from God? Right? So Matthew chapter 10, starting with verse 16. Jesus says, I'm setting you up like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes, as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. For in that time, you will be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. 
Brother will betray brother to death, and the father is child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. They will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roofs. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very heads, hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid you are worth more than many sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge him before my father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my father in heaven. So we've got kind of two sides in this debate. We've got to decide we should really seek to keep the peace. We shouldn't make a big deal about specific teachings of the Bible. Let's not make assertions. On the other side, we've got, we need to stick to, to what God's Word says. We need to boldly speak the truth, no matter what the outcome is. And which side was Jesus on? Boldly speak the truth. Boldly speak the truth. First, on the side about loving peace, what does Jesus say over and over is going to happen to his disciples? Bad stuff. They're going to be arrested. They're going to be pulled before the government authorities. There might be separation in their families or pain in their families because of what they believe in. So there's not going to be peace because the world doesn't love the Word of God. And what are the disciples still supposed to do? Are they supposed to make assertions about God's truth? Yes. In fact, if, if, if God whispers something in their ear, what are they supposed to do? Shut up from the rooftops. Right? If they're called to acknowledge Jesus, what are they supposed to do? Acknowledge Jesus. Okay, so just think back to these quotes we had. Take away assertions and you take away Christianity. What if Jesus' 12 disciples had gone out in the world and said, you know, there might have been this guy who thought some stuff. And, you know, if you really want to, maybe you should think a little bit about that guy. Okay, how much of the world would have been changed by an assertionless Christianity? Nothing. Okay, I've got three passages here. Let's just read one more. Romans chapter 10. So go ahead in your Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Romans. Romans chapter 10. We just heard these in the confirmation part of our services last Sunday. We're going to talk about confessing our faith. So Romans chapter 10, start with verse 9. It's right in the middle of the paragraph. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So according to those verses, do Christians need to make assertions about their faith? Yes. Absolutely. God says if you believe something in your heart, what are you going to do? Speak it. Confess it with your mouth. Right? The next few verses give one of the reasons why it's so important. So I'll keep going. Verse 14. How then can they call on the name of the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. 
But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of, about Christ. So I think those second words there explain why the first ones are so important. Why is it so important that Christians need to confess their faith? So, so that, that people can hear you. So that other people can hear. Because where does faith come from? From hearing the message. From hearing the message. So if we want more people that have faith, they need to hear the message of Jesus. If people are going to hear the message of Jesus, what do people have to be doing? Confessing their faith. They have to be confessing their faith. And for people to be confessing their faith, they have to have someone tell it to them. And that person needs to be sent out. You have this whole cycle of God calls on Christians to boldly confess and profess their faith so that God may be glorified and more people's souls may be saved. And so you go back again once more to this quote. You take away assertions and you take away Christianity. If Christians were to stop asserting the truth that the Bible says, what, were to happen? what would happen? Nobody would hear them. They would always want to try to be good people. That'd be the end of it, right? Okay, now, of course, it's not going to happen. God says his word is going to continue forever. But if Christians were to stop making assertions, you don't, you don't have Christianity anymore. Anybody follow that? One other place we could look at, we're running out of time, is 2 Timothy 4. So maybe on your own tonight, look up 2 Timothy 4. Alright, so here, here's the full statement that Martin Luther says. The Holy Spirit is no skeptic. The things he has written in our hearts are not doubts or opinions, but assertions. Sure and more certain than sense and life itself. Isn't that a great statement? Okay, the Holy Spirit's not, not doubtful. What he plants in our hearts through God's word is sure and certain. As sure and certain as life and death itself. Christians can be confident when they speak God's word. So the Christian will make assertions because Because we believe in Jesus. Good. And what's in our hearts is going to come on our mouths. What else? Because the Holy Spirit gives us those things. Because the Holy Spirit gives us the courage and the power and the strength to speak God's word. Good. Why else? We're certain. Because we're certain that's true. Because we're certain that's true. Right? Christianity is meant to be bold in making assertions. Maybe just one caution. What caution do I need in making assertions? What if I phrase it like this? For, for me to make an assertion, I better be sure that I'm speaking the truth. Speaking the truth. Okay, and as Christians, if I want to be sure that I'm speaking the truth, what I assert needs to be from the Bible. From the Bible. So we want to make this one caution. God does not call on Christians to stand up and assert foolish things that are not from God's word which sometimes Christians are known to do. Okay? God does not call on Christians to stand up and assert political things that are not found in God's word. But he does call on Christians to stand up and assert the truth of God's word. This is what God calls on every one of us to do. It helps to do it in a kind and caring way as well. It helps to do it in a kind and caring way. Absolutely. That's what people sometimes criticize Martin Luther about. He was very kind and caring with common people. He was not very kind and caring with false teachers. And so he ultimately tells Erasmus, well, I'm going to write this book because people's souls are at stake. Right? I don't want to because you said so many foolish things that I shouldn't have to even write against. But people's souls are at stake. And so I have the responsibility to speak the truth from God's word, and I'm going to assert that. And if you're not going to assert what you're saying, you shouldn't have written your book in the first place. He was advocating for our souls. Advocating for our souls, absolutely. Any questions that far? So this is what we're going to do, and we're not in a rush. 
And I'm not expecting you to read the book at all. If you wanted to, you could, but I'm not expecting that. And we're going to be using the Bible. We're not just going to be looking at quotes from the book. And we're just going to go through it, follow through different questions. And especially the first part of Rasmus is going to make charges. Well, you say this, but it's false. And we can turn those into questions. What about this? What about this? And we'll see how God responds to them in his word. And it's all ultimately tied to our, our will. What are we able to do? No questions about that? So you can see what we didn't get to tonight, which is okay. Is the message of the Bible clear? That's the next thing that Erasmus is going to get into. And then they're finally going to discuss does free will even matter? And Erasmus has the goal to say, free will doesn't even matter. Right? So, so everyone says, why are you writing a book about something that you say doesn't even matter? But what Luther's going to say is free will is the hinge on which the whole Bible's message rests. And so he says, you don't realize it, but you've written about the most important thing that we all need to know the truth about. And that's what we'll find out. Come back next week. We close with a prayer. <coughs> Dear Lord Jesus, we're, we're thankful for the truth of your word. We talked tonight about making assertions. And Lord, we pray that your spirit would fill our hearts through your word and then make us bold like you sent out your disciples. Help us not uh, to be timid. Give us the words to speak and confess your truth. Lord, you, you say in, in your word that it's good for us to learn from the past. As we hear about this debate 500 years ago, we can look around us and see people debating today about free will and what human beings are and aren't able to do and about what it means to have faith in you. Lord, we pray that you use these Bible studies and the word that we hear in them to convince us of your truth, especially of your truth, that we're saved by grace from beginning to end. Be with each one of us as we travel home tonight and bring us back here again soon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.